So yes, it's wonderful. It's wonderful to be here. Push that back. I'm talking too loud. Like you know, it's got to be. Do what? Way to Is that good? Okay. okay. I'll try not to. Uh, uh -huh. If I get too excited and get too loud, y'all calm me down. But it is great to be here. And then uh, my great thanks to, to John for initiating this and Jim, who had just met, um, and for Marissa and the Cab History Center for hosting us, and, and Stacy Katrin, who um, I'd been talking to about my grandmother um, for quite a while, and sort of like, I need to do something. I need, I really need to do something. And so I'm sure she was working behind the scenes. Um, and as my grandmother said, I guess I just did what, what one of her statements in one of her garden schools is when someone gives you a gift, you accept it and you say thank you. And she then proceeded to thank the sponsors for her talk. So thank you all for bringing and for getting me into um, all of this excitement. All right, let's see what we can do. Uh, Fletcher was an amazing, amazing person. Um, and what I hope, um, how many days are we going to be here for y'all to listen to me? Um, she loved engaging with people um, and offering uh, people the opportunities to grow in all of its meanings, uh, both their gardens, but themselves and connections with other people. And we're going to take a very quick tour of her very busy life um, and, and, and trying to focus somewhat more on the 35 years she was here in Decatur, um, which the thing she is most known for and that really um, has, has amplified her presence was the creation of a garden school and promoting that. Um, which she, her garden was always open. Um, she invited people in, she created facilities for people to come. She shared her knowledge freely. And of course she did have this great abiding love for camellias. Um, and she did all of this, uh, which is great for us to remember, a hundred starting, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, as a woman, um, through the Depression, through World War II, um, and the, perhaps even more deadly than everything else, through changing styles of gardening. Um, but luckily, she has left behind a lot of written material. And, um, and I have finally been forced to deal with it. And you probably cannot read this wonderful, wonderful letter. Uh, which I hope not to choke up, but uh, my grandfather left with the material. <clears throat> he, he wrote in 1965, basically um, charging, giving a charge to the family. This is what my wife has left. She was incredible. You all need to do something with it. Surely there's some member of the family. And as my, my late father-in-law would say, I have willingly become the stucky. So I'm, I'm the keeper of that. Um, so Fletcher grew up in Montgomery, Alabama. Um, her father was a dentist, and which is significant. He had his own business um, and was an entrepreneur, I guess, in that regard. And he came, she came from a long line of people who valued education. And that was impressed upon her, and she embraced it. Um, she also demonstrated her entrepreneurial skill um, quite early. Is that little red dot? There we go. Uh, um, by playing among the, um, her mother's camellias um, and finding these beautiful blossoms on the ground. And as she reported, and it's been reprinted many times in different camellia um, literature, uh, would, would create, scoop out of the ground a little hollow, put some moss in there, take the best blossom, lay it in there, <laughs> then put a sheet of glass over it and cover it back over. And she would then offer peep shows to her little friends. But she didn't just give those away for free. They had to give her something for them. And that uh, she seemed to like that idea. Um, but so, so this family album shot uh, shows her both as a little girl, um, as sort of a, an adolescent with, out in the yard, and then at the bottom with uh, my grandfather before they were married, as they were courting. Um, and one aspect, uh, again, of bring, coming back to education, um, and I haven't got the timeline exactly down, but it seems like they met in 1906, 
she graduated from high school in 1907, and she had been accepted to Randolph-Macon Women's College uh, in Lynchburg, Virginia, and um, happily went up there and started classes in September of that year. And um, it was rare. I mean, it was rare enough for women to graduate from high school in those days, and very rare to go to college. And the, uh, the courses were a bit impressive. She was taking English, Latin grammar and composition, Caesar, Cicero, Virgil, algebra, plane geometry, and French. So she was um, struck with appendicitis. And I am still, again, I'm enough of a cynic and, um, to wonder if that's a euphemism, but she basically left school. She came and came back home. And I don't know, again, the time frame on that. Um, but the, the, the offshoot is that uh, she and my grandfather, Treadwell Rice Crown, for whom I am named, uh, married in 1908. And they then moved, they lived, stayed in Montgomery for a little while, then he was, he moved, they moved to Wilmington, North Carolina, then up to Alexandria, and then he was promoted to district supervisor of American Agricultural Chemical Company. And they came to the Atlanta area and chose Decatur. As a, as a nice spot. And this is the property, it's not a real clear, but the Sanborn map, um, of the property that Fletcher actually bought. Um, we believe she is the one who bought it. Um, the title seemed to have gotten lost, but, uh, um, but there were four lots. Uh, the top lot that does not show a house on it is where the creek comes through. And I just wanted to give a sense of where in Decatur she was. So it's really just right down the street, uh, across the railroad tracks, right adjacent to Agnes Scott. Agnes Scott now owns that property. Um, so they came to Decatur in 1924, and Granddad traveled a lot. He had to go out and check all the fertilizer plants, and Lord knows what else. Apparently, he, he was uh, my sister, who is here, uh, reminds me, she was the eldest of my siblings, and um, he was always taking the train down to Miami and then hopping on the boat and going over to Havana because there was a lot, guano was a huge part of fertilizer. Um, so she, he was traveling. She, when they moved here, she had they, their two sons, um, uh, my uncle Treadwell, who was 15, and my dad, John, who was six. So she had her hands full with those. She immediately plunged in. She was on the PTA of both Decatur High School, where my uncle went, and Winona Park School, where my dad went. She, um, there was a library support drive. She was involved in that. Uh, not surprisingly, she was involved in the League of Women Voters. I mean, this was something that had just happened, that primarily white women could vote. And it was just like, all right, let's, let's see what we can change here. Uh, she was very active in Holy Trinity Episcopal Church. Um, and most significantly for us today um, is she was a charter member of the Decatur Women's Club, and especially the Garden Division. And uh, that is where she really, I think, got a measure of interacting with fellow gardeners and the power of women together and what we can do and what, how we can help make this a better place. Um, this stage, I'm not sure which, where this is. She, her first garden school was in, at Holy Trinity Church in the parish hall, and there was some sort of a, an auditorium. And I know the women's, Cater Women's Club built their building with a display area. Um, so, and this, so I haven't tracked that down yet, but uh, she, she was busy. She was busy and she was engaging. Um, so she started doing the schools. Um, and the, they were a big hit. She, she's, it, the first one was the Holy Trinity and was a fundraiser for a worthy cause there at the church. Um, and they charged a minimal admission price. Um, then the, she was, again, active in garden clubs. Um, 
a garden she set up, and I, I'm still a little foggy about this, there's not a lot of documentation, but she, so she could, conducted the garden school in Decatur and then Cartersville and Rome. And she was conversant, I've got at least one letter from, to and from Martha Berry, where she had done a program for them and promised to send wildflower seeds and was apologizing how long it took her. Um, again, this is like 1930. Um, but as she was very proud that, that the girls were, that maybe they would know, appreciate the fact that it was a lot of trouble to find native wildflower seeds and how important it was to conserve our native plants. It's like, again, a hundred years ago, it's like, great. But this got the attention of the Peachtree Garden Club, which itself had not formed, but maybe five years before. And they awarded her the, the second, she was the second person to get this, the, the Peachtree um, Garden Club uh, Medal of Achievement. And that was a big, uh, a big deal. And she received it at the uh, meeting of the Garden Club of Georgia, which Peachtree Garden Club had been um, instrumental in, in forming uh, in Thomasville in 1930, is when the meeting was. Um, and again, so that she was in a bigger meeting, that bigger group there, and, and kind of getting statewide recognition. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. So that planted more seeds, and they were obviously appreciative and, and recognized that this garden school and reaching out to people, um, although people basically um, middle class white women primarily, who were again movers and shakers in their own right, and um, as. as Richard and I have talked about it's um, the glass ceiling was pretty firmly in place that was, the women were limited as to what they could easily do and so they had to be extra creative and it is and it is very interesting what all they accomplished but again she continued to educate herself she was very big on on the self-education and she did a correspondence course at the American Landscape School in Iowa um, and, and, and got her diploma, her certificate of diploma um, in 19, she did that in 30 and, and got the diploma in 31. Um, and at the same time, she was already beginning to make forays into the other cities in the state. Uh, she had a, a five day um, beautification, community beautification. She was part of a five day beautif community beautification program in Brunswick. And she was also up in Virginia. Um, and I don't know if that was, partially to visit a sister and then to maybe visit her friends still at Randolph-Macon and um, but gave, a, gave some talks up there. And so the, the 1930s were her boom decade. It was the right place at the right time. People were trying to beautify their homes and their gardens um, and their communities. And so she began to look at different ways to get her uh, name out there. And so um, this created this flyer. Um, gives both recommendations. It's very, very well thought out. Um, she, it, it, it shows basically, uh, it conveys a sense of who she is, where she gardens, um, what she's capable of, capable of and the numerous options um, of, of ways of gaining this knowledge, whether as a at a class, at a meeting, at a lecture. Um, and she, again, had big, a big horizon. She was, this, she was doing well. She was getting um, uh, her, her, her name out there, her experience, and she wanted more. So in 1933, she figured out how to get herself to Europe on a garden tour <clears throat> and spent a couple of months traveling around. And it's some very odd, I mean, you can look the list, and I didn't get into it all, but some, some odd countries we would not think of necessarily as, as gardening. Um, Finland, uh, Czechoslovakia, um, it was, but she did go to France, did go to England, went, uh, spent Austria. It was, it was an, an odd, an odd time and an odd place, but um, she had a big time there and she enjoyed it and came back with this European street cred under her belt. Um, she, she also came back with, and, and then shows up in her writings for quite a while, um, uh, an interest in alpines and in rock gardens, um, neither of which really translate well for us in the South. And so she finally had to give up on that. But it does create good photo ops for the, the rock gardens. 
Her first commercial effort that I've been able to find uh, was uh, uh, working with Sears. And she figured out sort of these big department stores, um, which were an epicenter of things, um, were always looking for ways to bring more, more uh, customers in and more clients. And she figured out sort of that she could help be a linchpin there. And um, so here, this is an, an invitation letter that she came up with on Sears and Roebuck stationery that she sent out to chairman of garden clubs, inviting them to come have a meeting at Sears, actually, and, and to say, and besides, we've got this great thing, besides the garden schools that she'd already been started doing with Sears, Sears had figured out to open a garden department. Whoa, lo and behold, so come and see the gadgets we have. Come and, you know, we're happy to talk with you. I can lecture you. I can, you, know, you can have your meetings here. Um, and there's lots of other good things you can see and do. So she was, again, figuring out ways to work with um, these, these folks and these entities. And her garden schools were fun. Um, she had a good sense of humor. Um, and she was engaging. And she also, and she would change outfits as she did different things, whether it was sifting soil or being fancy and doing garden design. Um, but she would, she, her, the kind of, the, her, the gist was like, if I can do it, you can do it. It's not that hard and it's really fun and it has all these benefits and, you know, it's, 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 it's great for you. Um, she also, there's one, one of the things I think from the, uh, she was working, me, she was working different media, and so she was beginning to work with the newspapers um, and kind of question and answers. And one of her, uh, one of them is, is great. A, a letter as a writer comes. Will you please tell me what to do in my garden now? Every time that I start to do something, my husband says it's too early to do garden work. Surely there is something I can do now. And her answer: You evidently are new at being a gardener as well as new at being a wife. <clears throat> if you had gardened longer, you would know that now there is so much work waiting to be done, you will keep busy every spare hour. And had you been married longer, you would know how to answer your husband when he is trying to have you follow his ideas. <clears throat> Since my writing is only on garden questions, I'm sorry not to be able to answer both questions. And then she goes on and focuses on the on the garden, but it's like she gets engages with folks, um, and and again she found different ways to connect with people, and then she did the big breakthrough was tying in with the, the Atlanta Constitution. Realized this is this is something good, and she came up with the idea, um, and and it kind of probably started with Sears, but it really it reached its peak with especially the Constitution possibly the journal, but the Constitution was in the forefront here, um, of kind of coming up with a three-legged stool of, of garden schools. Um, it basically, uh, merchants had things they wanted to sell. The newspaper wanted advertising, and people wanted to learn. And so if the merchants would advertise in the paper, the paper would then provide all this free promotion and advertising of the school, the school was then free, which was the key point that she kind of came around to. People then invite people in, and the merchants could then be there with their displays, um, and it's like everyone, it was a win-win. They could, she could answer questions, she could show people how to use things, and everyone was happy, and that, that became big. Of course, the world was also happening, and this is, there are some amazing front pages, and it's, it's so great, I just love this, that, you know, here it is, the, we're in the early rumblings of pre-World War II, but uh, with Italy invading Ethiopia, um, there are, the black shirts are beginning to really create some problems in Italy, and yet on the front page, there's Fletcher Pearson's Garden School, you know. It may, the world may be going to hell, but come to the Garden School. And so she, this again, she, she came up with another flyer, and this one for merchants. And this is where she does kind of explain it all. Like, so yes, advertise. This is how you can get in on this. There are, people are hungry for this. They want them. Uh, they want to be able to do it. 
Um, and it, it, it's a great cycle. And it did. It, it uh, again, became such a big deal. Um, so, yes, yeah, so there's the other side of the flyers, kind of showing the audiences that she'll get. And here she, she is not a sifting soil in that outfit. This is her garden design outfit. I mean, she is very fancy, a landscape architect. Um, but, but charting things out, she was a huge, ever since, um, probably perhaps before, but that getting that degree in landscape architecture, which again is not the same thing as the multi-year schools we have now, but at that point, that the idea of design was huge for her, and she continually preached that and stressed that and taught that and talked about it, that it's like figuring out um, where to put things are more important than what it is you're putting because that defines your space and that makes it agreeable. She had a, and I didn't find it and probably don't have time, but um, a, a great quote about uh, how you determine uh, what, if, if someone is offering you a free plant, whether you take it or not, and it's like, if it's something you really have been wanting, then even though it's the wrong time of year, you gladly accept it and say thank you. If it's something you're not so sure about, you very, thank you so much, I'll get that at the proper time and hope that whoosh, everyone forgets about it. <laughs> so, this is perhaps my favorite front page of all, where she goes head to head with Hitler. I, um, 1938, and World War II is about, I mean, it, it's we're on the teetering on the edge, Hitler is pushing, he invades Austria, um, but there's that garden school. You know, it's, 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 you think about how crazy media is today and then this strange juxtaposition. I go, well, a hundred years ago, you know, it was kind of crazy then too. But, um, so kind of leaving the thirties, going into the forties. Um, here she, this is, uh, I apologize for the quality, but she's down in Tampa. I mean, it's like, Gardening really doesn't work in Tampa, and she would have the, there were a bunch of letters, so she corresponded with Floridians, and she would do garden schools in North Florida, um, but Tampa, she realized, was out of her area, but she could still do flower arranging, which was something else she taught, judging, and judging flower shows, which was something else she taught, and garden design. So she found a way to be marketable, and again, people had heard of her and wanted her to be there. Um, and the 40s are known for other things, too. Those fascinating, fascinating uh, fashions. Um, and, but, and so I think this is, this is a hasty, you know, there's a hasting seed. And so, yes, uh, Jim and John were talking about, and I, um, and I bet those ads, I have not encountered too many of those. Um, I've a lot of time looking in old constitution, land of constitutions, um, I have not, the journal is not as accessible to me at this point. And so I need to, uh, that, that may be where Hastings is, because um, you did a lot with Hastings, um, and I'm finding out more. Um, one of the other things she did that was uh, part of her success uh, was she would, um, let me find how I phrase that very cleverly. Well, she, she kind of curated, um, she sought out and curated letters of recommendation from satisfied entities and from the newspapers who would write her. And there are some wonderful in there about like, you know, we really thought this was just going to be goodwill. Okay, the women are excited. Let's do something and calm them down. It's like, whoa, we couldn't believe we brought... Our, our sales increased with advertisers we've been trying to get and they wouldn't advertise. And it's like, oh, it's just one, everyone's talking about it. We're getting all this positive. When can you come back? And so this is from Birmingham and I think from Selma. And she did, she ventured throughout the South. Um, she was up in Tennessee. I, when I first started gardening in Knoxville, ooh, many years ago, uh, one of my clients realized that I was her grandson. It's, oh, I went to, remember going to see her uh, speak in Knoxville. And it was like, that's, that's so great. Yes. Um, her, one of her other, the, the uh, main sponsors turned out to be Riches. And she worked with Riches in a number of different ways. 
Um, and I think, again, sort of like, I think Riches saw what Sears had done and thought, oh, we need to snatch her. Uh, and, and I'm not sure she seemed to overlap with several companies and how she had the energy. Um, again, at this point, the boys were older. Fred was probably out of the house. My dad was well into high school. So, um, but, so this was a, a, a lecture tour that she was doing around the state of Georgia, paid for by Riches. Because at that point, um, you know, Riches was the big store. You went, made your trip to Atlanta to do your shopping, and Riches was where you wanted to go. And so this is the letter from Mr. Rich confirming, yes, we will pay you $500, and here's where you, you need to be and who you're talking to. And, um, but again, she figured out how to, how to work with people um, and with these businesses to, to expand this, this gardening um, but then in the 40s, the war really happened. And um, so it's kind of shifting from flowers uh, more towards vegetables and food. And so she started working with, besides her other sponsors who were, she was still working with, she started working with <clears throat> the extension agents, um, a, a acronym, let's see, the American Women's Victory Services was a group here in Atlanta. Greater Atlanta, excuse me, I know we're in Decatur. Um, and it, it kind of helped engender um, and deal with rationing and deal with um, how to help people grow their own food. Uh, and so she was, she was active in that. Uh, and, and she also then started working with Davison's. I mean, Davison's Garden Department, I do not remember that. But apparently back in the 40s, that was something they wanted. And so... <laughs> Vegetables for victory. Here we go. Uh, it was, uh, again, people wanting to, to do something and also actually needing to grow more food. Um, but the war uh, hit home. <clears throat> and, ooh, excuse me, uh, this is a picture of Fletcher and my grandfather and my father um, in uh, Fletcher's garden. And uh, probably as he had, had just been commissioned as a Marine officer uh, before he went overseas to the South Pacific, which luckily, obviously, he returned from. But uh, it was a big deal, a big deal. And, um, and also as a, a plug, that this is one of the few pictures um, I actually have of her garden, which I'm going to have to try and recreate. And luckily, my husband, Richard, is a landscape architect, and we can draw that out figure out how to show, because it was something, uh, well, getting ahead of myself, it's, um, <clears throat> excuse me, so the war's going on, and meanwhile, back at Riches, um, this is not the best picture of her, I'm not sure how she allowed that to happen, um, but I, I, do, I think she went through some sort of a health crisis in the 40s, and it may be that, but but so Riches is, is, again, trying to branch out. Besides, she's now the new consultant. I mean, she's been working for them for years. But now she's a new consultant in 1942, um, and is running their garden department on the sixth floor of downtown Madison, uh, downtown Atlanta, um, and inviting people to come and doing talks and showing them. Uh, in fact, I have a, a, a late friend in, in Madison who remembers meeting her there and um, going up there to check out the gardening stuff. But Riches did this interesting thing also of starting, tying in, trying to get multimedia of tying in to radio and starting a little radio program. And she would answer questions on the radio and talk about things on the radio. And as this flyer, the ad shows, also they came up with a movie. It's like, wow, come see a free movie, okay? And I think uh, the Atlanta Constitution could figured out, okay, we're a newspaper, but if they're using the radio, we should use the radio. And I believe uh, Enterprises own WGST. And so they put her on and said, you know, let, let's do some talk on that, see how that goes. Um, it's uh, um, just kind of jumping around and seeing what, who can we reach? Who else is out there? Um, 
but she was also still judging. Um, and that was in the uh, flower shows were going on. Um, this, I think, has got uh, Charles Hudson is the tall fellow, Nelson Christ. Charles Hudson, I remember his name from the paper. He shows up a lot. He had a column, regular column in there. Nelson Christ, I'm not so familiar. And then Mrs. Bowman, who I do not know who she is. But uh, here they are kind of, again, promoting a, a, probably a flower show in Atlanta, and they were going to be judging those entries. Um, and later in the 40s, I guess this is, I think, about 1945, and they must have gotten news that either the war was over or that um, my dad was coming home or something. They looked very happy and very dressed up. So grandfather and grandmother um, love that. So, as we enter the 50s, Crown Camellia Garden. Um, and she was getting a little older. Um, had, her gardens had developed. She really loved to share them. Um, and uh, we we're actually lucky to have the little baby in arms here in 1949 in front of the Crown Camellia Garden, my sister, who is with us today. So, very, very pleased. Um, but she started advertising the Crown Community Gardens um, and both sort of as a nursery. Um, she also set up the, the center kind of badly uh, faded newspaper clipping um, was she set up in her basement what had been the rec room for uh, Uncle Tred and my dad when they were kids and that my dad had helped dig out the basement for it, um, the DeKalb Garden Center and it was open uh, the library was open, I guess it's open like two days a week. Her garden was open to wander through all the time, uh, but she would hold meetings there and she would promote it and try and get people to come. Here's a resource, here's a garden to be in. Um, and then she was also then trying to find different ways to market um, these camellias that she had gotten fascinated by. She, uh, like many of us, and it, it was thought that this was too far north for camellias. And on one trip to Alabama, uh, she went through Selma when the camellias were blooming. And she writes about this in one of her articles. That, um, she could not believe they were just so gorgeous that she had to have them. And she said she could find out very little information about them, which she said was probably a good thing because most of it might have been wrong. But she ordered 15 rooted cuttings um, of Chandlerai Elegance, which was one of her favorites and uh, stuck them in the soil and amazingly they all grew and they turned into these blooming plants and she was hooked and just started going, oh man, camellias, these are the best. Um, <clears throat> so this is sort of, that was at one side of the front house, front of the house. This is the other side facing McDonough Street and again showing and it was like a professionally taken picture and I know there have to be more. And again, in our research, we feel sure that there, with her notoriety, there have probably been like some, the Sunday magazine and the paper or something has done, has done a series and there've got to be more pictures um, of the gardens. I mean, that's what it was all about. But this is one just showing very well kept. And I love the, the bicycle that is on the, um, kind of leaned up against the front porch, whether that was intentional or not. But uh, that probably is how uh, helpers came to work. Um, so here she and my grandfather relaxing in the circle, which is where she had an outdoor kitchen. It was kind of their seating area. Uh, we would gather there as a family even after she was gone. It was uh, um, kind of the, the place to be and to relax. And, um, and here she's again promoting um, the camellias gardens and, and getting groups to come and trying to, as always, get more members. Let's have, a, let's have the big meeting here. And she was, again, constantly educating herself, wanting to know more, and uh, came up with a plan to go visit uh, Uncle Tred, who at that point was working for Lockheed out in California. So she and my grandfather uh, took this big trip out in the middle of summer um, to California, ostensibly to visit Uncle Tred, but you can see the notepad, she was taking notes of all the nurseries, where to go, what she saw, what looked good, as well as collecting you know, these, the different camellia um, booklets that she, again, were available in the Garden Center, her basement. Um, and 
the, uh, the, the write-up in the paper is great um, because it talks about, you know, what's going to happen to her garden. And the, the gardener will take care of it as well as the neighbors. And then one neighbor's doing chrysanthemums and one's doing daylilies and one's doing something else. But it's like, it was interesting, the gardener. It's like, oh yeah, who was the gardener? Well, these are pictures my dad took in 35. One of his father sitting on the front stoop, and then one of two fellows he knew very well. Uh, sadly, no last name, Mason and Eugene, um, who were, he felt some affection for, enough to actually put in his photo album. Um, and again, that kind of that sign of the times and that awkward uh, reality that we are still struggling with um, as to who these people were that helped create uh, this wondrous, wonderful gardens that we enjoy. Um, the actual gardener that I think she mentioned, or was mentioned um, by occupation, but not named, uh, was Emery Thomas. Um, he actually made it into her photo album. Uh, again, maybe a picture by my dad. <clears throat> Excuse me, but uh, interesting on a page in her album that has her some nieces and nephews in Alabama, uh, one of her gardens show judging the pictures and Emery. And he does have a last name, which is, again, significance. It's still awkward and weird, but it's, it's great that it's maybe some progress is being made. Okay, onward. Her Camellia Notebook. This has been a treasure. I mean, it's tiny. There are not that many pages, but her notes in it are so great um, and gives us a sense of what she was kind of some of her challenges. Uh, the, the first one uh, on debutante is, is wonderful. She bought a big plant. It tells the, the price where she got it. And, and the nursery, I don't recognize, Malibus. And she paid $14 for it and planted it out and then started selling blossoms because they would bloom at the holiday time. And people, you know, florists didn't have all that much if florists even existed. And she would sell blossoms for a dollar a piece. Or people were buying a lot, 75 cents. And it was, um, and she would keep track of when they bloomed and what, um, you know, what, how long they bloomed, when they started, when they stopped. <clears throat> the other side, Asia in the no other notebook, um, talking about all these wonderful camellias she had ordered from California Gardens, how much she had paid for these, da 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 da, and get to the bottom, all dead, 1951. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh, the heartbreak, the heartbreak. Uh, one of her moments of notoriety um, early in the camellia world, I guess, well, 50, 52, I think it is, the, um, when she, she's here pictured with a, a camellia japonica leucantha, which was definitely one of her favorites. And um, she air layered it. They were still grafting a lot. They weren't, for whatever reason, I don't know if they didn't have the rooting compound, but they, they didn't root things. It was so... A, and I think grafting, if you were skilled enough, you could graft and get a blooming plant quicker than by rooting it. But it was then, you also had that graft joint and grafting was pretty tricky. She went back and reading in literature, saw this article on air layering, and she and another garden buddy figured out how to do this. And so for the uh, American Community Society meeting in Savannah, um, had air layered this, started it in April, cut it loose in, in October and brought it to the plant program. Kind of that, that same kind of, if I can do it, you can do it. Look at this, you can have this wonderful big blooming plant. Um, so, and I love too on, on the back of the picture is the, like it tells who she is, what, what has happened, what it represents, and please return and do not cut the picture. <clears throat> Um, and this, you know, we don't have time for me, but she, she kind of had a sense, not kind of, she had a sense of who she was and what she had done. And she would spell it out because she was also using that as introductions for new groups that she had not yet talked to. And so she would, um, there are some great um, moments in this uh, where she sums up her life and they've been very helpful. And then I was impressed that she also, besides she had her landscape architecture degree from um, Iowa in, um, in 1931, she also went back to school and got a, a short course in landscape architecture in, in 1958, signed by Ian Hubert Owens, 
Um, it's like she wanted to keep learning. She wanted to decide what's new, what are we thinking, who, what, how, can, how can we better help people? So we move <clears throat> excuse me, through the 50s and in, um, she's still working with riches. She's still lecturing. She's not actively gardening as you know, poor people, certainly, but um, I found this uh, list sent to her uh, from Riches showing her, uh, she's not traveling throughout the state, um, she's 71 years old, or would be 70, you know, 71 in, in January of 1960, uh, of her scheduled garden talks, um, who, what garden club she was going to. She was still like, I want to go out there, I want to talk to these people, um, and uh, sadly, she <clears throat> didn't give those. Uh, she uh, went into the hospital in February and died three weeks later, still in the hospital. And it was, uh, she was, in truth, not in the best of health, but it was a shock, and especially to my grandfather, which uh, it took him quite a while to uh, recover from that. And... And, and to her friends, and to, um, and then sort of, I think part of what helped him was sort of being left with all of her stuff, all of her garden school material, all of his correspondence, and like, what do I do with it? It's valuable, it's what I have left, besides the garden outside that he did maintain. Um, but there's some wonderful memorials in uh, different groups. This is from uh, the, at the Cab Flower Show a year later that uh, had a nice memorial for her. Um, so this is probably about 1965, and it's interesting timing um, that uh, I was in Boy Scouts here in Decatur, um, and they're standing in the garden with my grandfather, with my dad, um, and about that same time, I, I think my grandfather was beginning to write these notes about this is what this is. This is why this is significant. And so in his wonderful spidery hand writing, a picture of the camellia named for Fletcher. And for some reason, that was a little more accessible. And um, I remember seeing that, coming across that from things I'd gotten from my dad and sort of like, oh yeah, there is a camellia. There's something named for her. What, you know, it's, an, it's odd looking. It's pale pink, okay. Um, and, uh, Richard knew um, where the garden had been. My dad, of course, the, the property when my grandfather died in 75, um, the property was sold to Agnes Scott. It was, Agnes Scott owned everything up to it and really wanted it. And at that point, the family story is, it was so beautifully landscaped, uh, the college was going to build the new president's home there because it was just perfect. Uh, whether or not that was true, I don't know, but the recession happened as many of us remember in the 70s. And they certainly had no money to build a new president's home. And it turned out what they needed more was a running track. And so sadly, the garden basically got bulldozed and a running track was put in. But right at the street, uh, Rich went by and checked out these, um, the, the property and made this wonderful little diagram, sketching of what, this is an interesting plant. This is the camellia that's got some blooms and he brought home some blooms and um, uh, sort of, I realized, oh, I saw a funny picture of that, of a camellia. That looks a lot like the one that's named for Grandma. And uh, sure enough, amazingly, through incredible good fortune um, or providence, possibly they knew what they had, I doubt it, um, the Fletcher Pearson camellia is still there. It is on the edge of the street. It was something that did not get bulldozed, and it still blooms. Um, it's, uh, it's just great and magical. And so the Fletcher, the Fletcher Pearson um, camellia is beautiful. It's, um, and it was developed uh, as a, a seedling, a chance seedling from Lady Clare. And Lady Clare is an incredible uh, camellia. It is a uh, tetraploid, um, which probably doesn't mean a lot to a lot of people, but it means it has extra chromosomes. It's much, very hardy. And when I was in the nursery uh, working at Cedar Lane Farms Nursery, 
after when we had been trying to grow camellias. Uh, I was there in the early 80s, and we had um, we had the two back-to-back -back horrible winters, uh, 80, December of 83 and January of 85, that were went down to single digits and then went into negative digits. Um, and camellias, we realized we can't, no, we can't be growing camellias. And the owner, Jane Sims, and I were driving through the country later that year and passed a little brick house, no trees, nothing around it, but there was a camellia in the front yard and it was Lady Claire and it was blooming. And we did a U-turn and pulled, said, and went and met the guy uh, and said, what is this? I don't know, it's mama's camellia, it's always been here. And it's like, can we get cuttings? Sure, sure, make cuttings. It's like, this is a hardy camellia. So I was excited that um, Fletcher Pearson is a, his progeny of Lady Claire. And sometimes, and the one on McDonough Street, the cuttings Richard got, some have come up to look like Lady Claire. And I'm not sure, again, I'm guessing it was probably grafted and probably onto other Lady Claire. So it's, it's important to be in bloom to get the right one. But so her friend and neighbor, uh, Miss Geiger, she showed in the same shows. She uh, um, uh, was, they were obviously well known and Mrs. Geiger obviously held uh, Fletcher in high regard. And I, I did not realize, I was very happy to realize that, that uh, Fletcher was still alive when she was bestowed this honor um, that to have this named after her. Um, and Ms. Geiger's house on Palafox um, is still there. Um, it did up until a few years ago. The landscape had not been touched and there were a lot of camellias and I put off going by and looking to see and it's unfortunately been redone. So. There's not a lot of the old left still there, but uh, it's um, 1959 came on the scene, and ah, this little note um, is in was in there, and it's not her handwriting, and it's not Granddad's handwriting. I don't know, but it's an early um, showing that uh, Fletcher Pearson Crown Camellia Bloom was entered in, um, and it was the only flower of its name um, did not win a ribbon. It's like, ah, but it was entered. That was good. And, uh, and, and the other sign is to show that, yes, the Fletcher Pearson Crown Camellias can be enjoyed in a number of ways. <laughs> so, some think of them as a salad bar. Uh, okay, obviously I could go on and on and on. Um, uh, one of the final thing um, I will say, and uh, we'll wrap it up, is the, uh, one of the questions I wondered about this wonderful portrait of, of Fletcher and where it came from, because there was no family history that I knew. And here in the papers, this tiny little cutting, clipping, about the um, Crown Garden Club. And it was a group of women who apparently so loved Fletcher and appreciated what she'd done, they, they created a garden club and named it after her. And they were meeting in at a member's house in Lithonia, and it's just, I, love, I love reading these things and trying to figure out what they're talking about. They're, they agreed to donate a couple of books to the library, whatever the library was, and decided they should have a painting of Fletcher and donate that to the center. And I'm, again, not sure if that's the Cab Garden Center in her basement where Granddad still lived or what, but somehow it came into our possession. And it is uh, a great, great... Uh, memorial and tribute to have. Um, okay, I've talked over my time limit. Um, probably bored you all to tears and I'll answer any questions or we can break up. I don't know what we're doing time when we get kicked out. But uh, thank you all. It's, uh, She, it's, it's interesting, um, she did private landscaping. Not that I am aware of. There is an early reference in the, actually the late 20s, um, kind of as she's building street cred. One of the newspaper articles talks about, besides her garden school, um, that she is associated with a landscape architect in the greater Atlanta area. And I forget his name, I meant to write it down, it's like J.R. Hoffman or something. 
But uh, that was there was that one brief bl glitch, and I think then she realized her talents lay elsewhere, or that she wanted to be her own boss, um, which was a refreshing thing. Um, but I don't, but I don't think she did landscape. She, you know, she would give advice. Uh, she would probably come over and tell people, maybe even point out. But uh, in terms of uh, other than that, I don't know. And there may be more. Again, there's still a lot of her papers for me to go through. But yeah, yeah, thank you. I know she, she had an, an, uh, a big effect on folks. Yes? <laughs> they now reside in our house. Um, and we do need to find a home for them, and whether that's the Cab History Center or Cherokee Garden Library or sort of after I ascertain if the heirs want to keep them and endow them and set up their own research center, I don't think so. Um, and the other thing, of course, in, in, in the process of, of putting things together for this talk and trying to be more technologically aware, scanning stuff, realizing that having a, the scanned files would be great. And, and I don't know, I need to talk to archivists and figure out how to make this all work. But it would be wonderful to continue her uh, aspect of sharing information. And it is, <clears throat> there is a lot, there is a lot. I, the things, again, I'm missing, and I, and I haven't, I haven't taken advantage of the CAB History Center's archives, so I will be back. Um, but our pictures of her garden, I mean, she spent all this time, and in my mind I can see them because it obviously influenced me growing up and running around in them. They were such a great place to play. Um, and, and personal correspondence. She kept a lot of really great letters um, that were more business oriented and kind of how this was all working. <clears throat> Excuse me, but her letters, um, whether they were saved or, you know, as someone has pointed out, it um, they could be the recipients figuring out who she was corresponding with um, and if they, if they have saved letters, that would be wonderful to see. She was... She was a writer. She was, I came up early on with it. She was uh, industrious, innovative, ingenious, and inquisitive. Um, and she just, and was constantly, where she got that energy, I do not know. That, unfortunately, I did not inherit from her, I don't think. It did, apparently. Um, and it was interesting to me that apparently other people realized it before I did. Because um, I liked, I mean, I grew up in the garden. Um, I knew her very, um, my sister knew her better than I did because um, I was talking to, I think, I remember the golden wedding anniversary, which was at the Decatur Women's Club in 1958. And we were on our way. My dad was transferred from Quantico to El Toro in California. And so we were there for that. And then they came out, they must have come out to visit us in 1959. Um, because I was thinking maybe that was the last time I saw them. And then I remembered, no, we've got pictures of them at Knott's Berry Farm um, when we all went out there. And we were and it's like, okay, so they did, they made that trek out one more time to California. And then she died. Um, uh, so, but yeah, so I grew up in that garden, even after just her not being there and loving it. And then being just interested in, in gardens. Um, I... I started off as an English major at Suwannee. Uh, Suwannee, I had way too much fun. Uh, dropped out and helped start a commune. And so that got growing things again. And then went back to school and extracted a degree in plant and soil science from uh, UT and Knoxville. So, and then after the big job offers didn't float in from, Knox, from TVA, I knew that I was just gonna sit back as a college graduate. It's like, I realized I had created my own gardening business uh, while well, to work my way through college, and it's like, I don't kind of like this. I like this independence. And so, yeah. You know, and I came down here to manage a nursery, did that working for, with, and for someone else for five years, and thought that there are aspects of that that are really good, but I do like my independence. So, yeah, the gardening gene. Yes? Um, one of the things that I love when doing a little bit of research about a you brought up a lot of public summer, but I found a couple of other advertising companies uh -huh. that she, um, like, the gardens and the gardens. Um, I mean, yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yes, yes, she did. And she was, again, one of the things Richard found, which is very interesting and no, there was no news of in, um, in family lore, is when she first came to Decatur and was sort of casting about how should she... Suddenly, these real estate listings were showing up uh, listed by Fletcher, Fletcher Pearson. And it's like, not Mrs. Fletcher Pearson Crown, but Fletcher Pearson, like they're sort of like, and again, being a woman at that point, you had to be careful, and you, if you were, you didn't want to be immediately patronized and condescended to. So it's like, okay, if I'm going to do this business, I can use this name and sort of let's see how this works. Um, and I, she did not become a real estate wheeler dealer or mogul by any stretch. Um, she did uh, invest in obviously. You see the four lots, the house. My grandparents lived in one; they rented the other. During the war, as I find in Madison, too, it was not uncommon housing, especially after the war. Housing was very rare and hard to come by. She divided up her house into at least two and possibly three apartments and rented out another room uh, while they were living there. And it was just like, wow. And my dad was in the Marines. He was sending his paycheck back. She was investing it in property in Decatur. Um, the, the one thing... It's like, I look at all that she did and all this potential for generating money is like, there's a fortune somewhere. No, they seem to spend it. There was a, um, one uh, tax return that my grandfather had put together when they had invested and bought a greenhouse. They realized, okay, you can't really grow camellias here, but we can grow them in a glass house. Let's do that. So they bought an expensive glass house and built that. And um, she started thinking, figuring out how to sell root plants, craft plants, sell plants, sell blossoms, make help. And so it was like, um, I saw the first figure I saw and it was like, wow, Rich, in 1932, they made, you know, $37,000. This is, that's a fortune. It's incredible. And then I looked and the expenses were like 36543 <laughs> Ah, okay. So... Yeah, I had a history professor told me, said, yeah, yeah, people, you get money and you spend it. You get money and you spend it. But she did. She, she always looking, and, and there are, yeah, other, and the way she figured out these commercial enterprises, the different stores, Sears, her early Sears schools were marketed in the paper, um, both as a garden school and fashion show. I mean, don't we all buy our fashions from Sears? And it, they were big, popular things. And oftentimes the pictures of the paper would be of these beautiful ladies in their fabulous outfits from Sears. And it's like, come and see. Come and see what the latest is. Okay, so photos, her dress, you know, where does that race, like, well, you know, like, this is a her. <laughs> she, yes. <laughs> Yes, yeah, looking right, right, yeah. And don't I don't think I've ever seen a picture of her in pants. That was that was later. But, uh, but she did, yeah. That is that's fun. And yes, I, I need to. There is so much more, and she figured out media and how to utilize it. Oh, thank you. That's, that's great.